Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of our a moment of reflection for our servicemen and women throughout the world and for all those who died in the last week, particularly Patrick M. McCann, beloved father, grandfather, brother of my friend and former Scranton High School colleague Mary Kay, son-in-law, brother-in-law, and uncle, and his dear family and many friends who suffer his loss. Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Here. Mr. Rogan? Here. Mr. Loscombe? Mr. Joyce? Here. Mrs. Evans? Here. Dispense with the reading of the minutes, please. Third order, 3A. Tax Assessor's Report for the hearing dates held May 1st, May 15th, May 29th of 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3B, audit status report from Robert Rossi and Company, received May 30th, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3C, agenda for the zoning hearing board meeting to be held June 12th, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. Do we have any clerk's notes this evening? No, Mrs. Evans. Thank you. Do any council members have announcements at this time? Yes, please. Um, today, the 69th anniversary of the D-Day invasion, I would like to, to my dad and to all who participated in that momentous event, just like to say a thank you. I will stick with the patriotic theme. Um, I received a message from Charlie Spano from the 9-11 uh, Memorial Committee and the Flag Day Subcommittee. They would like to invite all citizens of Scranton to come to the courthouse on Friday, June 14th, Flag Day, from 5 to 6 p.m. June 14th was set by the Continental Congress in 1777 as the day to fly and remember the flag. The public event will feature the West Scranton High School Band and patriotic songs. The main speaker will be West Scranton High School and West Point graduate, Army Colonel Joe D'Antona III. President Judge Tom Munley will raise a large American flag after Willard Elementary School students describe the development of the flag through historic events. Please fly your flag at your home or business to honor America and the founding of the U.S. Army. That's all. Thank you. Mr. Joyce? The city of Scranton is seeking lifeguards for the opening of four city neighborhood pools this month. Applicants need not possess lifeguard certification. The city of Scranton will provide a free certification class at Weston Fields indoor pool to all those seeking summer employment as lifeguards. Interested applicants should contact Sandy Opshinsky or Colin Finnerty at Weston Fields office. And that's it. Fourth order, citizens participation. Our first speaker this evening is Ron Elman. Yeah. Thank you, Council. Uh, First off, that I find that disgusting, deplorable, despicable picture of the mayor accepting that 
$30,000 grant, just re rehensible. Andy and, and Bill should get the credit for, for all they've done for the children of this city and the Taxpayers Association. The, the mayor is the one that closed the pools. He created the problem. You, you shouldn't be rewarded for creating a problem and solving it. Uh, I, I just don't know words strong enough for, for, for what he's done, taking credit for that. It's disgusting to me. Secondly, Council finally passed a paramount measure to protect the people of this city from the continual oppression of the tax exempt entities we're, we're surrounded with. And when you have a chance to use it, you blink, you back down. You, you, didn't, you didn't defend the city like you should have. I, from, from the little I know about this move, uh, it was made to help stop them from, from what, what's happening. You know, why? Yeah, you, your allegiance is, is to us, the taxpayer, not the unions. And I'm a strong union advocate. I voluntarily belonged to two of them over the years. I, I would like to see as many union men working in construction as possible. But again, your allegiance is to the taxpayers, not the unions. And, and Last week, you just jumped over backwards. You were just, y'all just seemed so happy that this, that they were going to, you were giving them permission, I guess, to go outside their area. This wasn't right. Here, what are we supposed to be getting in pilots? 1.3, and they haven't done nothing to help us. Nothing, but you, you helped them. You're not thinking of the taxpayers. You know, we're being taxed out of our homes. The, the people, the, the, all their lives, they want a home. And, and God, there's just so many people I talk to. I've probably talked to 100 people that, this year that just can't afford things anymore. You know, it's not just the city taxes, it's everything. My taxes are over, my insurance on the house in five years has gone up $1,000 for some reason. I pay like 1400 I used to pay uh, 295 or something when I bought the house and it went up little by little. Look at, uh, Rendell has given the utilities a carte blank to charge whatever they want. It, 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 it just, it's, it's getting impossible to own a home in this city, to rent one. I got vacancies all around me they can't rent because they won't rent. When you do, you, you, get, you get a... My whole neighborhood has gone to pot because of the zone up there. I can't walk down sidewalks. I've said it a thousand times in here. Oh, the 2,000 block, the 2,100 block, that's all a bunch of guys staying in rooms they park on the sidewalk, the lawns. There's people roaming around all night in the, in the neighborhood. You know, it's not a police problem because they're there. Yeah, I, just, I told you I got uh, two months ago or so, 4.30 in the morning, there's a guy in my garage. And he knew the neighborhood. He ran in the backyard and disappeared. And I blame it on the zone, which is another thing. Nobody get, cares about the zone down there. You know what I'm talking about? It's that nightclub that stays open all night. You can't imagine the garbage that hangs out right on the street. They had a heroin bust yesterday on 1840 or something where all the, in, in that building across from the bank this way. The neighborhood is just going to pot, and when you talk to people, everybody complains about neighborhood in the whole city going to pot. And I don't know what the solution is, but something got to be done besides going to the taxpayers because we're not getting nothing for our money. The, every time it rains, I don't have a sewer on the corner 
there's water all over the place in my yard. You know, it's just, like I said, I'm not getting nothing for my money. I get good garbage pickup. I'm not mad at them. And I, I see police cars all the time. But when the police cars leave, people are going by my house 70, 80 miles an hour. And I'm not exaggerating, one after another. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Elman. That concludes our sign-in sheet. Is there anyone else who cares to address council? Good evening. Good evening. My name is Jim Devers. I'm the Associate Vice President for Facilities Operations at the University of Scranton. I want to thank you for the opportunity to address council this evening. I want to first read a letter that I've prepared for the members of council and then offer some brief remarks regarding the University of Scranton's proposed rehabilitation center project. Dear President Evans and members of council, at its meeting on May 30th, city council voted unanimously to introduce a resolution that accepted the historical architectural review board's recommendation to support our plan to demolish Leahy Hall to make way for our new rehabilitation center. Thank you for introducing the legislation for the first reading and for the public support for the project expressed by several members of council. Later in the meeting, however, council voted to table the resolution. I'd like to summarize briefly the university's actions on this matter to address my, in, any concerns that you may have. Because we knew our plan required consideration by the HARB, the university asked one of the project's architects, Mr. Richard Leonori of Hemler Kamide, a, a Scranton architectural firm and a member of the HARB, to share preliminary plans for the center with the group on January, in January of 2013. After the project was approved by our board of trustees in May, the university applied for a demolition permit with the city, triggering, triggering a formal evaluation by the HARB. We attended the group's meeting on May 13th to answer all questions as part of their typical and thorough approach to reviewing projects. During the discussion, the university agreed to stipulations to allay concerns expressed by some members of the HARB. We call these mitigation elements. Specifically, the HARB crafted the following mitigation elements that the university agreed to incorporate into the overall project. First, to include a courtesy review by the HARB for public incorporation of the Linden Street portico. Second, public recognition of the 1907 building by way of exhibit photo and text, including acknowledgement of the YWCA and its role in the city. With these stipulations in place, HARB as a body voted to recommend to City Council that they issue a certificate of appropriateness for the project. After Council tabled the motion, the University contacted the President and the Secretary of the HARB to confirm our recollection and understanding of the HARB's action and vote. They have indicated to us that HARB's vote on May 13th was appropriate, and the City Solicitor also confirmed and certified the HARB's vote. The Rehabilitation Center is important to the University's continued success in meeting its needs and the community needs. The needs of our students pursuing degrees in occupational therapy, physical therapy, and exercise science. The center will also provide substantial benefits to the city through the community service activities it will facilitate, the more than $900,000 in city taxes and fees it will generate, and the much needed construction jobs for hundreds of workers it will create. Sincerely, James Devers, Assistant Vice President for Facilities Operations. I have copies of the letter I'd like to present to Council. Certainly. Thank you. Oh, please. Are there any questions regarding my comments? Um, I can tell you that um, obviously there is some degree of, of misunderstanding in this situation in that um, I know our office made a request to HARB for, uh, for 
for it to submit to City Council any recommendations or amendment to the legislation that uh, they would deem appropriate. And as such, um, originally I believe they were to meet on Monday, June 10th. I learned thereafter that the president of HARB canceled that meeting. However, it's also my understanding that in place of that meeting, they are meeting today, in fact, at this time. Or perhaps the meeting has been adjourned by now. Mm -hmm. So uh, I am hoping that uh, their meeting will provide the necessary clarification that we were seeking and that we can get moving along more swiftly. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you've answered my first question. Uh, I just have a, 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 another question. At last week's council meeting, uh, a comment was made regarding the tabling of the second reading of the resolution until the zoning board acts on the issue. Since we have not made, uh, or nor are we required to make a request for any type of zoning for the demolition of the Leahy Hall, can you clarify what the zoning board needs to act on regarding the demolition? We have only received the schedule of the zoning board and uh, it appears that they will hear the university's request for a dimensional variance associated with its building construction. That's for the new building. But at last week's meeting, uh, the certificate of appropriateness covers the demolition of Leahy Hall. And I think it was Mr. Loscombe who commented that the zoning board needs to act on that. I believe the zoning board had, uh, I don't know about the demolition part, but they have to act on the sight line requirements and stuff that you're requesting. That's true, but the zoning board doesn't have to act on the demolition portion of Le uh, that we're asking for for Leahy Hall, correct? I don't, that I don't know. Okay, well, well I, I, I would like to see the whole project together before it's demolished. You know what I'm saying? I would like to see approval before you just make an empty lot. What, yeah, but what we're, we're applying for a for certificate of appropriateness only for the, for the Leahy Hall demolition. So the zoning board, it's just to help us because if we have to apply for something from the zoning board for the demolition of Leahy Hall, we want to know that. But according to our architects, engineers, and legal counsel, there's no requirement for us to apply to the zoning board for the demolition of Leahy Hall. And that's, that's the confusion that I have as well. Well, certainly I think the point that uh, Mr. Loscombe is making is that it would be um, probably more appropriate to bring legislation before City Council after each step in the process has been followed and approved. And I think that's what's happening now in terms of the Zoning Board. They'll be meeting next Wednesday. So it's not a matter of a postponement of months. They'll be meeting, as I said, in less than a week. And council always receives the decisions of the zoning board. And after we have received that decision, as well as um, HARB's report, then we'll be happy to place the legislation back into sixth order on our agenda. OK. So I'm to understand that there is no requirement right now for us to go to the zoning board re for uh, the demolition of Leahy Hall, that I don't portion think, of the project. I don't think anyone on City Council can respond to that for you because we are not the zoning board. We are the City Council and we do not handle those issues. Okay, thank you. Do you have any questions of me regarding the project? No. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who cares to address Council? Good evening, Council. Marie Schumacher, citizen and taxpayer. Good evening. Um, first, I'd just like to make note that the Mulberry Street parking where the meter heads were removed, there are still no parking signs, and the removal of the white, li the white lines that zigzag traffic down Mulberry Street still remain. Uh, and a request that in the future, if you have parking heads removed for, uh, for these kinds of reasons, that I, that it, you make it a package deal, that everything gets done at the same time. 
there's no the only the only change now is we're not getting revenue because those parking meters and people are still parking there mm -hmm. the the um, it's still as much of a danger coming down and and going into one of those cars that's parked there so mrs schumacher i'm still working with pin dot on that uh i have a, a an appointment with the engineer uh we're going to be looking at that situation a little closer okay thank you uh the sooner the better uh now with regard to 5b that was tabled last week um i would just like to read a, a letter that i got just yesterday from the National Trust for Historic Preservation, of which I agree very much, it says, every year our nation's history, our beautiful landmark buildings are threatened by the wrecking ball. It's more than heartbreaking to watch the destruction. Historic homes, landmark commercial buildings, sacred battlefields, they're being torn down to make room for parking lots or shopping malls or urban sprawl. And when they fall, they take with them our ties to the past and our understanding of our own history. The uh, destruction of the 1907 uh, YMCA falls into this category and I think the mitigation that's being offered of a couple pictures and a, and a history is, is meager at best. I do not believe that building should be torn down and I don't think the university, I think the university should be staying within their industrial zone or their institutional zone and uh, you've all many of you at least have spoken about the need for that and but always seems to get pushed into the future and I think now is the time to act uh, three on the uh, 5b for tonight is the intent to make this a paid parking lot and, and what, is the, what is the need in that area for uh, another parking lot of the city? What, what does the city have at the corner of Kapaus and Marion? I, I don't believe it will be um, a for-profit parking lot. I think it will be um, likely used by uh, a new business that may be locating into a building in that area and they need the parking for their employees and customers. Well then why aren't they buying the parking bill, parking this lot instead of the city buying it and maintaining it for private business? Is that I what you're telling me? I don't know. Well if that's the case I would like the, I mean <laughs> I know a lot of businesses would like somebody to put up a parking lot. Certainly. We had a business and I had a, a parking lot and the zoning board did not like it and uh, I just think it's not that's not very fair to us taxpayers well we can certainly uh, get an answer for you before a final reading on that issue I certainly would appreciate that and next what is the status of the Lake Scranton Road analysis and the final cost what did the final cost come in at um, we have not yet received the report of Civil Crossroads engineers. Um, I believe that they have been conducting their study of late. Um, what, what, I, what I have heard at the same time is that very coincidentally, the truck traffic has halted during the period of this study which of course is going to skew the results of the study. But, you know, beyond that, I think that raises two questions. The first being, well, if the trucks are no longer traveling that route, they must have found an alternate route, which is the case all along. And secondly, um, if they're no longer traveling that route, you know, obviously there's a, there's a purpose to this absence thereof so that you know, they would not be made uh, part of the consequences of their travel and the visual aspect of their travel would not be able to become part of this study. Okay. okay. Uh, what is the date for receiving that? I don't have the date. Oh, okay. Um, I, I, that brings up another issue, though. I know, as I've stated many times, that uh, Seymour Avenue is is restricted to uh, trucks for delivery only, 
but the parking, but the sign advising that is because of the angles of the roads, it's only for the only readable by the wildlife across the street. It's not readable by people coming up the street, really, or coming down. And, and the thought occurred to me, because a lot of traffic, a lot of traffic, including semis and tractor trailers, comes across the, that road. Why? There must be two ends when there's a when there's a uh, no truck traffic allowed, where it should be there should be a sign on both sides, mm -hmm. so that traffic doesn't come up. So how how does one find out? Obviously, there is one on 307 not to come in to Seymour Avenue, but where does that zone end? Does that include all of the East Mountain? And if so, why isn't there a sign down at the base of East Mountain Road to, um, to keep traffic off that route? How does one find out? I think, uh, Mrs. Craig, if we can send a, Mrs. Uh, or Ms. Schumacher's question to the appropriate party and we'll, We'll do our best to get that answer for okay. you because I think you've raised a very good question. I mean, it seems when you put up one, you should put up two because it ends someplace, hopefully, a or it's useless. Right. Um, next, um, there are, if I may finish this point, there are no minutes uh, posted for the April 11th meeting as yet, mm -hmm. and nor have there been any minutes posted from, and I know there was a temporary um, stenographer here during part of the last month, but uh, from the meeting of May 9th through the 30th of May, which is four weeks, there have been no consecutive weeks, there have been no minutes posted. So I would like to know too when those are gonna be current. And also I, what happened to April 11th? I don't know what the issue is. I wasn't even aware there was an issue, but I'm quite sure that they will be posted as they always have been. Well, as they always have been was on a weekly basis, so that's quite a tardiness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have anyone else? Yes. Thank you, Council. Um, I just have two things tonight. Um, I haven't heard anything about Mark Walsh Day in the city, and I'm just kind of curious as to what happened with that. Does anybody have any idea, or did something happen and I just don't know about it? Okay. Well, I'm just, I'm wondering because uh, I still feel and think, I don't feel, I think that Mr. Walsh did a lot for the city, and I think that the city should really show some respect for a man who contributed a lot to the city. And um, the other thing I have is, as a young adult, I lived in the Hill section, right across from the University of Scranton in Hitchcock Court. I've watched the growth of the University of Scranton over a very long period of time, from my mid-teens until now. Um, I think in many instances, the university is a major asset to the city, but I do have to say that when I was a child, I believed the building we're talking about tearing down was the YWCA. And I'm really troubled by that development, to be quite honest. Um, I think that a lot of the city's landmarks were given in trust to the University of Scranton to protect them. Now, there's churches up on the hill that were conveyed to the University of Scranton. Um, they're still standing. But I really would hope that the University of Scranton would show some respect for some of the landmarks that were conveyed to them, in, uh, in my opinion, in a trust. And residents of the city saying, we want to preserve these assets, and we're willing to turn them over to you to preserve them. Um, and I do understand the university is a business. And I understand that the university has to build facilities for the students that come here. But then the question is, can we do both things at one time? I think the university can build this structure that they want to construct elsewhere. I just think that the more they move their assets closer, like the former Glen Alden Coal Company, they own that now, uh, they have for a while. They built the bookstore across the street. There's been a continual movement towards town. And I agree with what Marie said about containing the university in a certain area. And I just think that if we allow that building to be torn down, 
we're doing two things. We're losing um, a very important asset to the residents of this city that has a very important history to this city. And we're allowing the university to build and continue to expand. And I think it's a problem. Because nobody's going to tear down a building or an asset without a plan. The plan may not be here today, but it may be here tomorrow. And I just think that it's time to say no to that plan. And I'm glad the council tabled it. And I don't, and look at I just don't, I don't want to see that building torn down. I just have watched many assets of this city torn down. And, I've, and I think that when people understand what's taken place on the Hill, everybody wants the university to be successful. That's my opinion. I want it to be very successful. I want Scrantonians to go to school there. I want them to come out and I want them to contribute to our society and make Scranton a better place. But I think we have to realize one thing, at what cost? I don't think it hurts anything for that building to stay there. And I think that when that building became pr the property of the University of Scranton, the people that conveyed that property to them had some understanding of what was going to happen. And I think the greatest gift that this council could do would to go into the Scranton Times archives and find out what was reported and why these assets were transferred or why they were sold and find out what's actually occurred here. And I don't see any asset, I don't see any benefit to this city to tearing that building down. And maybe the, the whole council disagrees with me. And I can live with that. But I just remember being, growing up on the hill, Mr. Uhaas's building was there. Um, there was a grocery store on the one corner. Morton Apartments were across the street. The university has continued to buy and build. They've gone up the other side of uh, Hitchcock Court and built, bought some structures there. And there's just been a, a continual, uh, you know, growth in the hill. But my question to this council is, I think that the, I think the YMCA stands for Young Women's Christian Association. And I remember as a child the role that Played. And I remember the YMCA, which was catty corner to this building that stood on the corner across the street where the high rise is. And I just think that maybe the university should protect some of our assets that have become theirs and build or do what their project somewhere else. Maybe you'll agree. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening, Council. Doug Miller, Scranton. Um, Good, evening. Good evening. Just like to begin tonight by uh, a brief announcement. Uh, I was made aware that the uh, the fire department is uh, currently selling uh, five dollar lottery chances to uh, raise funds to purchase AEDs uh, for little leagues throughout the city. I uh, certainly think this is a, a wonderful cause and just uh, another example of you know the the great community service work our firemen do throughout the city. And I, I truly appreciate that. And and, and obviously anyone who's uh, looking to support the cause. Uh, can purchase uh, these tickets, uh, I was told, at TP Sports Cards. That's over on Luzerne Street. Uh, it's uh, Tommy Patterson. He's one of our firemen. Uh, he has uh, some of these uh, chances that you can go and purchase. Um, you know, we've talked an awful lot about the, uh, the AEDs that we here in the city have. I believe, Mr. Laskam, you can correct me if I'm wrong, we have five of them, I believe. Yes. And uh, unfortunately, they're not in operation. And I was told that the reason was because... Uh, we don't have batteries to, uh, to power them. And I, I found that to be an unfortunate thing because if, if batteries is what's holding us back, I think that's uh, you know, something that should be uh, you know, addressed and taken care of immediately. I don't understand why it's so difficult to uh, find funding to purchase batteries for these AEDs. I mean, these are devices that save lives. And I think we need to really take a look at this and address this. And I know we've talked about making sure that all our fire trucks um, you know, have these and, and they should have batteries. I don't understand why that's such a difficult thing. Um, moving on to another matter, uh, we've talked about the pools in the last few weeks. Uh, we, we were made aware that uh, Wells Fargo has partnered with the city, uh, contributing $30,000 to operate four pools throughout the city this summer. Um, you know, myself and many other residents, uh, you know, year after year have come to this podium uh, begging that uh, the neighborhood pools are open. And, and obviously, this is a very uh, positive thing, something that we should be proud of, that uh, you know, children throughout the city will now uh, no longer suffer. They'll have a place to recreate and swim uh, with other children. Um, I, you know, I appreciate the work of council, particularly Councilman Joyce, who I know uh, met with the mayor. And, and I know Wells Fargo presented the check 
a few days ago down at Weston Field. I did see that uh, you know, in the media, so I do commend you on that once again and thank you. And I know there's many you know, residents throughout the community that feel the same way. Uh, in regards to uh, Pango, uh, we know they're conducting, I believe it's a 90-day trial throughout the city. Uh, they've installed uh, apparatuses throughout the uh, city that uh, are signals that allow us to uh, make payments through our uh, iPhones, smartphones, uh, credit card payments, debit card payments. Uh, my question uh, to council tonight would be, well, once this trial is uh, expired, do we intend on allowing any other uh, organizations or parking operators to come in and, and offer their uh, trial services so we can get a clear idea of, of where some of the other uh, groups stand? I don't think that's a question um, to which council can respond. I think that is a decision for the mayor. It falls within the uh, realm of uh, executive authority. Okay, thank you. Um, I know you know we've talked about Street Smart in the past, and and we were hopeful that we were going to give them a chance. Uh, and in fact, we were it was pretty much all set in stone just about. You know, Councilman Laskin worked on that, and, and I didn't know if we were going to look to go that way. Um, you know, perhaps we could send a, a letter to the mayor. I know it's, it's difficult to get responses from the administration, but in, in a situation such as this where we're looking uh, for an inst you know, a revenue source, I think it's very vital that we, we come to some sort of resolution uh, very soon. Um, I know this Pango has been doing a lot of advertising around town. Um, I know last week I, I noticed a, a large brain uh, throughout the downtown, smart parking. They had a big cardboard brain so they're definitely trying to promote but uh, I just hope that we can come to a resolution and, and come to something that's going to generate revenue for the city uh, in regards to the uh, University of Scranton this seems to be uh, an issue where we're, we're on here it kind of ties into nonprofits and I know Mr. Elman addressed the nonprofits tonight I don't think anyone's been more passionate about nonprofits than this council as far as reaching out and trying to uh, seek other payments I know in our uh, recovery plan, we were hopeful this year to uh, generate over 1.3 million. Um, it looks at this point we're going to fall a little short. Um, it's not because this council didn't try. It's not due to a lack of effort. It's just uh, you know when you're you're dealing with organizations who uh, you can only ask and reach out, and that's exactly what you did. And we can only hope that moving forward um, we can continue to pursue, and that the nonprofits will would be willing to contribute a little more. Uh, I think you've been a, certainly been a watchdog for our tax dollars, um, in particular Mrs. Evans, Mr. Joyce, and, and Mr. Loscom, and your efforts. Uh, in regards to the University of Scranton's project, um, I, I certainly think you're, you're taking the smart course of action. I don't see the, uh, the need to rush this through. I don't think it's appropriate. I think we've seen what happens in the past when we rush things through. Uh, we seem to run into some, some complications later on down the road. So. I do respect your, your tabling of that last week, that piece of legislation. Um, you know, I don't see the mindset behind voting against that. I, I don't understand the mindset of, uh, you know, Councilman Rogan or Councilman O'Goff and going against that. Um, I agree with Councilman Loscom and his, his uh, concerns that uh, this is something that needs to go through the proper channels and we need to make sure we have all the information before we go and, and, and pass a piece of legislation like this. Um, you know, again, we're dealing with an institution, a nonprofit. Uh, who contributes, in my, my feelings, very little to the city. Um, we could talk about the good things they've done through the years, but the fact of the matter is they only contribute $175,000. So we've had a history in this city of rushing things through, and that's why you know, we're on the verge of a fiscal cliff today. So we need to do our homework, analyze everything before we go and rush things through. Thank you. Thank you. you. Good evening, Dave Dobson, Good resident evening. of Scranton, Texas paid, dog license. Uh, okay, uh, last week I mentioned, and once again, uh, please contact the DPW and get a different explanation for the recycle because their current explanation is the same size truck won't fit up the court for a recycle if it's put in the court. And that is, uh, that is a lame reason. They, they say, well, the truck won't fit up and the same type of truck picks up the recycling as it picks up the trash. So uh, what I would suggest is that we don't, we want them sequestered from each other. We want them separated so that they don't have to hold a debate every, every, uh, with every can uh, that they pick up. 
It's lame. Their excuse is totally lame. And uh, I don't know what you can do about this, but I noticed some of our yellow lamps uh, are caution signs on the uh, traffic signals are kind of quick. <laughs> So hopefully we won't have an accident over that someday. And I was driving by, uh, I took a brief get, a look down Mattis Avenue, coming into town, those par no parking signs I think are still there. So it's time that they go. Uh, we could save up a little money and put them in a the closet for later. Um, now I'd like to uh, comment on city council and different speeches that were made and you people have put up with a lot of abuse a lot of abuse not from the articles that are reported in the scranton times but the editorials you put up you've been blamed for things that prior councils ratified the 500 block of uh of uh uh, Lackawanna Avenue isn't filled up well. I've heard of business property bubbles back in, 19, in 2006 that we're building up towards a commercial property bubble mm -hmm. and that they're not going to be occupied. And if you go up on Commerce Boulevard, I, uh, there's uh, by Harbor Freight, half a dozen empty in the strip mall. So. It's not your fault, and I'd appreciate if speakers would consider that before they rant and rave up here about that, uh, those type of issues. Uh, if there isn't a business for them, then there's little sense in sinking all that money in, and I agree with that, but there's nothing you can do now. And furthermore, on the vote, you know, I'm going to quote my mother. Uh, Back when I was a little kid and it, made, it might have been raining or snowing or something or, or too cold out. Uh, and I'd get ornery with her. She wouldn't let me out the door to play. And she'd say, what are you going to do, run away and eat worms? <laughs> well, that's what I'd like to ask the non-voters of Scranton and the people that aren't concerned enough at election time or to participate occasionally in a meeting and keep their remarks sensible. What are you going to do? Sell your house and run away and eat worms? For what? <laughs> it's, it's just silly. Uh, it, it, the last election was very disappointing. And on these uh, institutions, uh, I'd like to say that, mention that, yes, uh, the university does give us a, a donation and pilot. And there's several others that don't. And it's time that I, I'm curious as to whether Lackawanna College has an institutional zone because they're actually exacerbating the whole situation here with, uh, with uh, uh, the amount of property that is getting taken in uh, tax exemptions. Uh, and I also, I, I, I lost the article, I cut it out for you, but there's an article I have from the uh, Scranton Times on a county looking to buy a building in Scranton. And that'll be off the roll. So we have a, a double whammy and triple whammy here with different, uh, different government institutions uh, taking, up, uh, taking up property. And, uh, you know, granted, they might still be blighted to this very day and maybe not and uh okay uh i'll make this quick the golden parrot goes to senator mccain last week he was uh talking to uh some people in uh, syria and a person noticed hey wait a minute one of those people that john mccain is talking to took me as a hostage a year ago <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you're around too long, no matter how popular you are. <laughs> Time to retire. Bok, bok. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Is there good anyone night. else? Good evening again. Good My evening. name is Sal Domo. 
and you uh, promise to have somebody come up and take a look into my driveway while I'm having problems. And I'm just wondering uh, if I can get any help out there. My, my neighbor is putting his blocks in my driveway and making it hard for me to turn around. And I haven't seen anybody or heard from anybody. Is there anything being done for my property? Uh, Solicitor Hughes, would you like to respond, please? It's been a while since Mr. Zuma was here previously, but I investigated that. Um, I don't have my notes with me, but I did discuss it with Don King, the city planner. He was out there. Um, as I remember it, that there's been two surveys performed which verified that the neighbor's wall is properly situate, that, that it's not on Mr. Zumo's property. Um, the other issue was with the um, driveway that Mr. Zuma was given an option at the time when they put the, when they constructed the sewer there, and I, I forget exactly what it was. Um, this goes back over a month and a half, I believe, um, and that he selected the option to just have a new driveway put in and sidewalk instead of what the other option was. Uh, I, I, I'll have to check this again. Uh, I did not issue a written report on it, um, but I did investigate it and that everything that's there, that this, if there is a, that there was a survey, I think there were two surveys done, both corroborate the fact that the wall is, is is properly situate that there's no encroachment um, and that it was a private matter the city really can't get involved in a property dispute between two neighbors mm -hmm. uh, but the the surveys do confirm that there is that the wall is properly on the right property and not on mr. Zumo's property that there was no encroachment that's how I remember it I'll have to go back and check it again but you know and there's really nothing that the council can do on this it's uh, um, and I believe there was a release signed by Mr. Zumo for his selection to have the concrete driveway put in um, but I'll, I'll check with Mr. King again well there's something wrong here somewhere because first of all when I come down here, I told you that it was there and that we, we found out that the wall was taken down and it was put in, left, once it left my property, it went into the, uh, across underneath the, side, the uh, wall and it was going into a two foot pipe, which the water all backed up into Zumo's property and it went out over my sidewalks. Mr. Meehan come down from his company and, and has this land of 45 degrees in my sidewalk so somebody's going to get hurt. They not only did that, they were going to put blacktop in my driveway while I paved everybody's driveways down there. So I don't, my sidewalk is on a 45 degree angle at one part of it and nobody's come back and they, uh, the water that was leaving my property originally where I had a good tell for 15 foot uh, cement tunnel they tore down was going into a two foot tunnel uh, thing there. Now, somebody promised that they'd get the wall back up. They, they took that cinder block wall down that's been up there for 70 years. Why should I have to put up with my neighbor coming? He has his blocks in my driveway where I have to, when I'm coming in and out, I have to go out of my way to, to, to accommodate him. It's been a while, but when I investigated this, I went over it with Mr. King. He was out there. Donnie King, the city planner, was out there. I don't know how many years ago it was, but he was out there with you, went over everything with you. There were two surveys. One was done by Hennemuth, and I think one was done by Mendola. I think Hennemuth was your surveyor. Mendola was the neighbor's surveyor that both of the surveys agreed as to where the location of the wall was. I, I don't know, but 
Mr. King did investigate it all, and he told you that the city could not get involved, that it was a private matter, and that, that the surveys refuted what you were saying, and that when the sewers were put in, you had an option as to what you wanted, whether they're all new sidewalks or, or something else, um, if it was just a driveway, and you selected the one option, and that's what Mr. Meehan put in from FabCorp. Um, and this goes back, I think, five or six years, as I, as I remember it. But I'll take a look at it again, and I'll inform council uh, as, to, as to what it was. I'll discuss it with Mr. King. Well, but it is a private dispute. The city can't get involved in it. The city can't get involved in it? No, it's a private just... dispute between you and your neighbor. Well, the wall was put, it was taken down by the city, and I didn't, I didn't, uh, I reviewed the creek. They did, they put it from, from uh, going out my driveway where they have my sidewalks on a 45 degree angle, was going out 10 or 12 inches over the curbstone, uh, and I don't understand when they're saying that I was agreeing to or anything else other than they have it done. Why did they reduce it from the 12 foot crook that was there down to a two foot pipe from the other side of my wall? I know I gave him permission and I didn't give this man permission to put the box in my driveway and whoever, the, and I had nobody survey my ground. Now, if any, if any survey that's done when it was done by your city, not me. Now, have, I'd like to see who, where they got their information from, but when I was here the last time, you agreed the wall was there for 70 years and be, you would put it back up. I don't think anybody ever agreed to that. In fact, I know no one ever agreed to that. Well, I, well, I may and be wrong, but I... the city did not take I, the wall down. It was the contractor that installed the sewers. You know, I mean, that was a contract, it was a publicly bid contract, and it was awarded to uh, FabCorp. But, you know, there, there's, I, I've given you the report as best I can remember it. As I said, this, this had to be about, you know, a, you know, a good uh, f four to six weeks ago when I, when I looked into it, and I reported it to council at that time. Well, you told it to that, that, I, uh, that this is all happening and I don't have nothing to say about it. They told me the wall was going to be put, up, put back up, that you took, the city took it down, they put it back up. That's been there for 70 years. And, and, I, and you take it down and I have to pay to have it put it back up? Am I reading something wrong here? Where, where am I going here? My sidewalks are destroyed. Somebody's going to get hurt, and I'm not going to be responsible for that. If somebody they have a 45-degree angle, and they promise to come back and put sidewalks in the driveway, pay, take care of both of the things, and they've done nothing. And I don't know, know where I ever agreed. Who, where was the agreement that I made with anybody here, that you know of? Who did they tell you I made it with? What's my alternative now? City's not going to do anything to put it back in the way it was originally? I, I really can't speak for the mayor. No, I don't but expect I, you I to speak have, for him. I, I'm assuming not. Well, I have to have something done because there's going to be a lawsuit. When you can take my talk, that big trick of that was going in my yard, once it went under that fence, they reduced it to a two-foot pipe. That is absolutely ridiculous. My neighbor is in there, he has his blocks out in my driveway, and if I turn around in there, I'm bumping him. He's taken from me. I didn't hire anybody to do the survey for me. So I, other than J John Meehan to come down and took to my sidewalks and said he'd put new sidewalks in and a new driveway for me, not to worry about a thing, and I'm still waiting. How long do I wait, and where do I go? Please give me some help. Mr. Zumo, I wish, I wish very much that we could help you. 
I'm sorry for all the things that have happened, but I don't believe anyone on this council was even in office at the time all of this occurred. And we have no authority to, to change any of the circumstances. Whose authority is it to put the, the uh, center blocks back where they were to start with? I didn't take them down, the city did. Well, uh, what, what I'm thinking that our solicitor was saying is this must have been involved in the, uh, I'm, I'm thinking anyway, the Meadowbrook Creek project. And that would have involved um, probably the Army Corps of Engineers or the state. And it was the Army Corps that was the designer of the project. Then it was bid to Fab Corps that was the contractor. Um, as I said, you could talk all night on this. Right. But and, I, and I, I know I spent time with Don King. He went over everything, answered everything for me. I gave a report to council. I didn't, but, you know, I'll, I'll do it again. No, I, we, we understand your concerns, but I think what our attorney is trying to say is that, you know, th there is nothing that city council can do to remedy this. And any remedy that you seek, you would have to do on your own through an attorney. I have to worry about my sidewalks that's got a 45 degree pitch and not put back where they were originally. I didn't ask them to do anything there. Just leave it like it was. Across the street, it's nice. They take mine and they have me down low. They put black, they were going to put blacktop in my driveway after the parking there, and I opened the driveway up that they didn't have to even go down to up or down Wyoming or Capalas uh, Avenue or Muncie Avenue. We made a street for them, and this is the payoff that I'm getting. But why should I have to put the wall back up? I didn't take it down. I I understand. I I don't know that any wall would be put back up, but. Um, We'll have, we'll have someone in contact with you who perhaps can explain this better Please, to you. Please, because I have to get this okay. straightened out before somebody gets hurt on my property. Thank you. And if they do, the city's going to be in for a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. I thank, thank you for you. your time, but please, uh, would you call me when you're coming out? Huh? Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who cares to address council? Mrs. Craig? 5A motions. Councilman McGough, do you have any comments or motions tonight? On the uh, University of Scranton issue, um, just a clarification. Um, the University of Scranton is already using Leahy Hall as a site for its um, classrooms, occupational therapy. Um, the, the new building that they are proposing would not be a change in usage whatsoever. So therefore, uh, you know, it, as, as far as saying it's an expansion of the institutional footprint, um, is erroneous because it's already been expanded it's already there it's being used currently um, and the other thing that uh, we're making somebody made an issue of the something about you know the tax exemption this property has been tax exempt for decades uh, the proposed new usage of the building um, would not diminish the tax base in any way since it has already been tax exempt in fact, the economic impact of a new building on that site would be um, infinite uh, since it's paying no taxes now. Anything that we would, the city would receive in um, fees, permits, et cetera, would be, um, would be more than is being received now. Um, and as far as trying to push something or hurry something, that's not the intent. Uh, I, I think that what was presented to us last week um, 
in form of a resolution was something that was uh, that I felt was appropriate. Uh, it had been voted on by HARB, it had been approved by HARB, uh, and all we were doing was accepting the recommendation of HARB. We were uh, doing nothing more. And I thought that at that time, given the face value of what was there, we should have voted on it and approved it. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilman Rogan, do you have comments or motions tonight? Yes, thank you. Just a few, um, a few comments and a couple requests. Um, first, I would like to apologize in advance. Um, I will be unable to attend next week's meeting. I will be out of town. Um, just two issues I'd like to speak about. The first one, this is an article that was in the Scranton Times and it was also reported on WNEP. Um, the headline reads, Scranton Public Works employees cite it for retail theft. And I'll read the article, it's only two paragraphs. Um, Scranton, a City of Department Works employee was cited for stealing $10.55 worth of dog food and deodorant from Redner's, Redner's Warehouse Market on Friday. Anthony Gione, 48, of Scranton, was caught by a store security officer as he was walking out of the 7th Avenue store around 1.40 p.m. Acting Captain Glenn Thomas said the security officer saw Mr. Ginone put items in his pocket, pay for other items, and then try to walk out. This was his first offense, and he was given a summary citation for retail theft um, under $50 and released. Mayor Chris Doherty and DPW Director Mark Dewar could not did not return calls for seeking comment. Um, the WNEP also reported on this issue, and the question that they had po were trying to pose to Director Dewar and Mayor Doherty was, was this city employee on the clock when this theft occurred? And if that is the case, not only do you have a theft, retail theft, but you also have theft of public dollars if this was done while on the clock. Um, so that being said, um, with my colleague's agreement, I would like to send a letter to Mayor Doherty and DPW Director Dewar asking if DPW employee Anthony Janone was on the clock when he was cited for retail theft. Furthermore, um, because of the lack of response, not only on this issue, but on many other issues, I will cut right to the chase and um, ask that a right to no request is placed. Um, please send in a right to no request inquiring what hours Department of Public Works employee Anthony Janone worked on each day the week of June 3rd to June 7th. I think the taxpayers of the city and the elected officials deserve to know whether this in fact happened on city time or not. Obviously the crime isn't a major crime, but it still is a theft. And if this happened on city time, that makes it all the worse. Um, so Mrs. Craig, with my colleague's agreement, I do have these, um, these items for you here. And just a, a couple comments, since it was a, a hot topic of conversation today, um, regarding the University of Scranton and the HARB um, recommendation. Um, I echo what Mr. McGough said. I, I fully support this project for a few reasons. Um, the first one being said that the property in question already is tax exempt. Um, if this was a property that was, um, was paying ta taxes or being paid on it, I, I would feel much differently about it. Um, but this is a property that is currently tax exempt and has been for quite a long time. Um, the city isn't receiving any money from it currently. Um, by going forward with this project, not only will the city receive money um, through fees and licensing and and other items, more importantly, jobs will be created. Um, I spoke to union representatives after the meeting last week and, and a, a few on the phone, and um, they're hurting for work. And it's been in, in reported in the media um, that our region has some of the highest unemployment in the state. And certainly something like this shouldn't be held up um, if, if we could do what we can to, to get the ball rolling and, and get these folks to work. And the, another issue that was mentioned was expansion. And one of my concerns if this wasn't passed would be that the University of Scranton, if they wanted to expand, instead of tearing down one of their tax exempt properties and building higher, they could go out and buy up other property that is currently paying taxes. And if that were to happen to build this building, then the city would lose long-term revenue um, by taking um, additional property off the tax rolls, which I know nobody wants to see happen. So I am hopeful that in next week or, or the following week that this will be put back up to a vote and it will pass. Um, that is all I have for tonight. 
um, until the agenda items come up. Thank you. Thank you. Just one brief comment. I think we've seen um, over the last 12 years a distinct spike in expansion on the part of the University of Scranton. And, you know, keeping in mind what my colleague has said, I think we all have to be cognizant of the fact that uh, they have been ever expanding throughout those 12 years and buying up one tax paying property after another, after another, after another, and expanding their reach not only into the downtown area but into the hill section as well. And I don't believe that, you know, and this isn't a comment on this project whatsoever, but I don't believe that the prohibition of this project would, or would uh, cause any further expansion than, you know, they, they would already have in mind. I don't think we've seen the end of it. I think it's going to be a, a continuous uh, growth cycle, uh, unless, of course, there will be different arrangements made through a zoning board to keep the university inside its um, institutional zone. And that's it. I would just comment that this, this is already a University of Scranton building. And I agree with much of what you and Mr. Lasko and Mr. Joyce have said on, on other issues regarding the university and nonprofits. But this issue is, is entirely different. We're, we're already dealing with a property that is University of Scranton owned and is tax exempt. Um, by holding no, it up. I, I agree with that. I'm not arguing that point. I'm just saying that, um, you know, if this project were to be stopped, saying that, well, they'll, they'll buy up other properties to provide for this project. That could be well accurate. However, what I'm saying is, I think we're going to see that regardless, that they are going to continue to devour taxable properties throughout the city and continue to grow and, you know, reach farther into the downtown and the hill section until possibly someday the city of Scranton becomes nothing more than a university town. Councilman Loscombe? Yes, thank you. Just a few things. First of all, I apologize for being late this evening. Uh, I thought I would have been here a little quicker, but uh, apparently I got tied up in traffic on Kaiser Avenue. Uh, several months ago, I had a complaint about the traffic on the Taylor side of Kaiser Avenue with this project, but uh, today I ran into the same situation. And, uh, you know, sitting well over 10 minutes in one spot without moving. I don't know. I think we have to get together with our police chief and uh, the construction company on Ka that's working with Kaiser Avenue Construction, Krieger, and uh, establish some kind of traffic pattern that's not going to back traffic up on one side without moving for over 10 minutes. I mean, it could be an ebb and flow, or perhaps uh, have North-South Road open for one way going north while this construction is being done, and Kaiser Avenue another way. But uh, to tie up the road for as long as they do, uh, I don't know. There's got to be a better plan. They're, they're working in the city, not in the suburban area, so there is a lot more traffic, and they have to be cognizant of that and safety vehicles. But uh, I will be uh, contacting the police chief to see if there's some way we could work out a better traffic flow. Um, with that said, the 2600 block of Jackson Street, there's some major I wouldn't even call them potholes, they're uh, craters that have been sitting quite a while there and they're in a blind spot. You hit them without realizing it. I do have some photos I'll pass on. If we could get, get a hold of DPW to take care of those or whoever's responsible for the original pave cuts in those areas, I don't know how they, they handle that. But it's been that way for, for a bit. Um, Someone mentioned about the park, I, I believe it was Mrs. Schumacher, about the parking signs not being taken down and that. And, and yes, we've requested that through this council office. We've sent letters to the appropriate officials to remove the no parking signs down by Chamberlain, and nothing has been done. Yet, ironically, you know, when they came up with this uh, new smart meter thing, the Pango or whatever, they pulled DPW employees for the day to sticker all the meters. 
Why can't they take a DPW employee to take those signs down, take an hour? Because we requested it, that's why. You know, and it's obvious, but uh, you know, those signs should be removed. And again, I am gonna be meeting with the officials from PennDOT regarding the Mulberry Street parking situation. It is a safety hazard. And uh, you know, we're gonna see what, what can be done there because we're not getting any answers. Nobody seems to know who put the striping there or or designated those spots. But uh, by next week, I'll be at the bottom of that. And that's just an update for those who question that situation. Let's see here. I do have some questions on, on 5B, and I will uh, ask those questions when it, when it comes up for a vote and uh, to be put on the record at that time. And again, uh, you know, I, as far as the University of Scranton, as I stated last week, I think this is a very worthwhile project. I think it's a benefit to everyone. Um, obviously, that building has outgrown its, its usefulness at this time, and the university has, has other plans for it. Um, it is, as, as my colleagues have stated, it is in a, a building that hasn't paid taxes probably ever, um, which is one thing. I, and again, I stated I was in favor of the project, and I'm in favor of putting people to work. However, uh, I was questioned on why I voted to table it. I, I believe we had some questions from members of HARB. Um, also, you know, I don't want to see a building demolished without an approved building going up there and, and sit as an empty parking lot for a long time. We have enough parking lots in downtown now. It seems every week we're approving a new, a new parking lot. But I don't see what the problem is while waiting for the zoning board approval for this. Uh, you know, it's a matter of just approving the HARB agreement at that point. But to go ahead and, and give approval to tear something down without knowing what's going to be there, without seeing what's going to be there, or have approval of what's going to be there, I, I just don't think that's prudent at this time. And that's why I have my, you know, my hold back on it. But I do think, seeing the history of the university, that, that they would put a, a beautiful professional building there. I have no qualms with that at this point. And, and I stated it clearly last week. My qualms are going into buildings that, that, that have been paying taxes over years or properties and, and utilizing those to become non-taxable. It is putting a heavy burden on the taxpayers in this city. But, uh, you know, there is no doubt, you know, that uh, the university has improved the hill section and uh, continues to do so. And, you know, I have family members that uh, are proud graduates of the university. And, uh, you know, I do applaud them for what they're doing. I would just, uh, you know, ask them to, to bear with us. Uh, we have a job to do here. Uh, we have to represent the taxpayers. And I think, uh, you know, everything will work out for the benefit of everyone. And, I believe that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilman Joyce, do you have any comments or motions? Yes, I'm going to try to be as brief as I could tonight. <clears throat> First, I'd like to talk about uh, the tax sale that uh, the city recently had. Um, as many may have read in the Scranton Times, the city uh, generated over $600,000 in revenue from this sale. I'd like to thank Chris Boland for his efforts. Um, and also, I wanted to report that Northeast Revenue did get back to uh, our city treasurer, Chris Boland, and, and they ran a, um, a distribution report of delinquent property tax payments for the pay period of May 1st to May 31st, 2013. And there's been 500,000 or 503,773.96 in delinquent tax payments and also $5,425 in delinquent tax search revenue. Uh, Northeast Revenue also ran a distribution of delinquent refuse payments for the period of May 1st to May 31st and the um, revenue generated from delinquent refuse payments uh, was $69,015. 
So I would just like to say I'm very glad to see the city receiving that revenue. And I'd also like to thank our city treasurer, Chris Boland, for his efforts. Secondly, I, I wanted to go through each of the uh, revenue and expenditure categories and kind of give an update of where we are for the year as far as what we're projected to receive against what was budgeted. As you know, um, Pell provided a report last week that I reviewed and they're projecting that we're going to see a $356,151 surplus at the end of the year, which definitely is, is positive news. And they're projecting that we're going to receive 102,144,473 in revenue, and that at the end of the year we'll have 101,788,332 in expenditures, uh, which will make up the surplus. But just to give everybody an idea of, you know, how much revenue we generate from what revenue sources, I'll begin by going down the list and naming that source, telling what was projected, and telling what Pell is projecting we'll receive. First, I'll start with real estate taxes. It was projected that we'd receive, um, or it was budgeted that we'd receive 19311056 Right now, Pell's projecting that we'll receive 18417762 so we're a little bit behind. Refuse revenues. It was budgeted that we'd receive four million five hundred and fifty thousand. Pell's projecting that we're going to end up with four million two hundred sixty nine thousand three seventy two at the end of the year. So we're a little bit behind there. The real estate transfer tax. It was budgeted that we'd receive two million five hundred and twenty thousand. Pell's projecting that at the end of the year we're going to receive $2,339,059. So we're somewhat in the ballpark there. Um, the earned income tax, it was budgeted that we'd receive $22,950,000. Pell's projecting that at the end of the year we're going to receive $24,936,261. So we're, we're um, almost $2 million over, according to Pell. So that's, so that's a very good note to see that we're, we're projecting to receive that much um, income tax revenue. Mercantile and business taxes. Um, it was budgeted that we'd receive $2,434,064. Pell's projecting that we'll receive two million forty-four thousand five thirty-five, so we're a little bit behind. The parking tax, uh, it was budgeted for two hundred and twenty-five thousand. Pell's projecting two hundred ninety-three thousand two hundred three, so we're a little bit ahead there. The commuter tax, as you know, um, was not approved. <clears throat> Other taxes, uh, it, it was budgeted that we'd receive $1,811,000 uh, in other taxes. Pell's projecting that we'll receive 1755425 So we're in the ballpark on that. That would include the amusement tax, utility taxes, et cetera. Penalties and interest, um, it was budgeted that we'd receive 104100 Pell's projecting 82,315, so we're somewhat in the ballpark there. License and permit revenue. Uh, it's projected that, it was budgeted that we'd receive 344,000, or 340, or 45, 3,445,063. Uh, Pell's projecting that we'll receive 3,348,766. So we're somewhat in the ballpark there. Fines, forfeits, and violations. Uh, it was budgeted that we'd receive 1,405,500. It 
and we're projected to receive 1,405,480. So we're, so we're right around in the ballpark there. Um, interest earnings, it was only projected that we'd receive 10,000, being that the city doesn't have a ton of money in the bank. Uh, Pell's projecting that we'll receive 86.67. Rents and concessions, it was budgeted for 25,000. It's projected that we'll receive 25,000. Intergovernmental reimbursements, it was projected at 2,921,682. It's projected by Pell that we'll receive this amount. In lieu of taxes, we're going to come up short. Um, we'll be receiving a little bit more than last year. At this point, it looks like we'll be around the $300,000 figure. Uh, the remainder that was short would be made up in con it, by uh, using the funds out of contingency. Departmental earnings, uh, it was budgeted for 2308500 and Pell's projecting that we'll receive 2188677 User fees, um, the, uh, this revenue was budgeted at 60500 60, It's projected that it'll generate 57763 so we're so we're in the ballpark on most of these MBROs. Um, Pell's projection was originally higher for the market-based revenue opportunities. It's been they've been now they're dropping their projection to a hundred thousand dollars, and that's what's projected that we'd re receive for this year. Miscellaneous revenues, 1,676,500. Pell's projecting that we'll receive 1,676,525. Um, bond issue proceeds, $5,100,000, and it's projected that we'll receive that. Uh, currently, the city is under discussions with Janie Montgomery Scott as far as um, the uh, 17 million dollar uh, borrowing that needs to take place for the fire and police award as well as the uh, 5.1 million for the uh, extra pension increase or the increase in extra pension payments interfund transfers uh, it was budgeted at 1,870,023 dollars Pell's projecting 1,873,982 and of course we have our tan which is 12 million and the bond issue, which is $17 million for the fire and police award. So that all adds up to $102,144,473. So let's look at the expenditures now. We have direct compensation, which includes the employees' salaries, uh, their benefits, their longevity pay for union workers, etc. That was budgeted at $27,043,697. Mm -hmm. Pell's projecting at the end of the year, we're going to end up spending $26,364,625 on employee mm -hmm. salaries and um, whatnot. That's slightly, that's lower than what was originally budgeted for. And you could probably constitute that to people leaving the city of Scranton, or, or employees leaving the city of Scranton for other opportunities, as well as um, people not being rehired back into positions due to attrition. Health insurance, uh, 13,953,885. That's, that's what the city was, that's what was budgeted for. Uh, what's projected by Pell is that we'll spend 13,885,973. And this is the cost of health insurance for city employees and uh, retirees that still receive city health insurance. Workers' compensation, 2700608 And it's projected that we'll spend 2602761 Pension contributions. It was budgeted that we'd spend 9590828 and it's projected that we'll spend 
531,752. And that's that's with the increase of $5.1 million this year. So uh, as you see, uh, the city has a large expenditure in, in pension contributions. Other employee expenses, it was budgeted for $1,340,999. It's projected that we'll spend $1,153,847. So when you look at the total employee expenditures of the city, you're looking at an expense of $53,538,957. And that's to keep the city operating on a day-to-day -day basis with uh, a full staff of fire, police, DPW, and administrative employees, as well as clerical employees. Other departmental expenditures, um, professional services, it was budgeted for 736,232. It's projected that we'll spend 667,982. So we're projected to spend a little bit less. Gas oil lubricants and vehicle repair. This was budgeted at 935,251. And it's projected that we'll spend 975,289. Landfill fees, uh, that's pr that was uh, budgeted at $500,000. It's projected that we'll spend $508,000. So everything is uh, generally in the ballpark with these capital expenditures, 309539 It's projected, or it, it was budgeted at, it's projected that we'll end up spending 195951 Liability and casualty insurance, that was budgeted at a million dollars. It's projected that we'll end up spending $1,320,000. Um, utilities, that was budgeted at $1,246,000. It's projected that we'll end up spending $1,820,000. And all other departmental expenditures, it was budgeted at $2,000,000. 360,000 and it's projected that we'll end up spending 2,376,000. And um, non-departmental expenses, interest and in, uh, debt service, it was budgeted for $5,519,088. It's budgeted, or er, it's projected that we'll spend 5788000 778 774 and moving on uh, prior year expenditures originally it was budgeted for four million dollars but some of the unfunded debt borrow or the unfunded debt borrowing took care of a lot of the uh, prior year expenditures so that was moved down uh, to 1.5 million dollars and it's projected that will end up spending $1,162,490. Uh, other operating expenses, it was budgeted for $181,500, and it's projected that we'll end up spending $702,159. And of course, uh, also other expenditures, we have the TAN repayment, which is, go which is going to be $12,800,000. Uh, we have expenses to the parking authority, which we're looking at two million eight hundred thousand. We're also looking at uh, a state loan repayment of a hundred thousand dollars, which that payment has been made, and we're also looking at uh, repaying the Supreme Court award, which is a seventeen million dollar expenditure. So altogether, that generates one hundred one million seven eighty eight three thirty two in expenditures. So when you put them all together, you end up with a $356,151 surplus. That's all. Thank you. And good evening, everyone. I have several items of business to address. First, the parking meter management contract has been awarded to Republic Parking System of Chattanooga, Tennessee, the lowest responsible bidder. According to administrative officials, the new manager should begin operations by early July. Second, I discussed a potential opening of the Kapaus Avenue pool with Mayor Doherty. I indicated that community volunteers had offered to make repairs 
in order to resurrect summer swimming in Pine Brook. The mayor responded that he would discuss necessary repairs with DPW and Parks and Rec Director Dewar to make a determination. However, he also noted that volunteer work may violate a union contract and that some services may be required to be bid. In addition, the city does not have the required number of lifeguards to open the additional four neighborhood pools throughout the city at this time. When the mayor informs me of his final decision, I will report it publicly. Uh, third, the former YWCA building is one of 48 historically protected buildings in the city of Scranton, according to HARB members. We have asked HARB to submit its recommendations for any clarifications or amendments to the legislation that was tabled during the council meeting of May 30th, 2013. In addition, the Scranton Zoning Board will hear the University of Scranton's request for a dimension, dimensional variance associated with its building construction at its June 12th, 2013 meeting. Following receipt of HARB's recommendation and the Zoning Board's decision, the legislation can be returned to the agenda in sixth order. Fourth, I wish to thank Mr. William Laser, Chairman of the Scranton Redevelopment Authority, for expediting the annual audit of the SRA this year at my request. According to his letter of May 31st, 2013, Rossi and Company, the auditors for the city, received a copy of the draft financial statements of the SRA in order that it could begin any related work required to be performed toward completion of the city's independent audit of 2012. Also, Mr. Laser notes that the OECD staff members were most helpful in meetings or excuse me, in meeting the May 31st due date. I appreciate the demonstrated cooperation of the SRA and the staff of OECD in our mission to produce a timelier annual audit. I also thank our city clerk, Mrs. Crake, for arranging and attending the meeting with the authorities and representatives of Rossi and Company. Hopefully, any issues with the remaining authorities will be resolved. Fifth, I'm very pleased to announce the inclusion of legislation in fifth order for introduction tonight that addresses handicapped parking signs in our city. I thank Police Chief Carl Graziano for his work and recommendations included in this legislation and for responding to my request for his assistance in expediting the installation and removal of handicapped parking signage and meeting the needs of citizens who have been waiting months to over a year for installation of an approved sign. The legislation establishes a renewal procedure for handicapped parking signs whereby any vehicle owner who has procured a handicapped parking sign must file a renewal application with the Scranton Police Department and pay a fee of $10 for processing payable to the city treasurer. The Scranton Police Department will forward a letter to all current vehicle owners having these signs stating that they must complete the renewal application and forward same with a check for $10 to the Scranton Police Department within 90 days. Failure to forward the application will constitute a forfeiture of the designation, and the Scranton DPW shall remove signage from the designated parking space. Further, the police department shall create a renewal application and issue a copy of same to any vehicle owner who applies for and receives a handicapped parking sign. This program will enable the city to remove signs where they are no longer needed and install them for those who have been approved for handicapped parking signs and have remained on a waiting list. Sixth, the results of the second annual treasurer's sale in which the city of Scranton realized over $600,000 are quite positive. 
Last year, the dollar amount generated leading up to the first treasurer's sale was over $1,115,000, with additional revenue realized on the sale date. The success of the treasurer's sale is due in large part to the commendable cooperation of the treasurer's office, the Department of Licensing and Inspections, and Northeast Revenue Services collector of delinquent property taxes and delinquent garbage fees for the city of Scranton. Councilman Joyce, City Clerk Nancy Craig, Solicitor Boyd Hughes, and I worked tirelessly to get NRS on board, negotiate its contract, and place its local office in City Hall. It is my belief that their duties and responsibilities should be expanded to collect additional city delinquencies, such as those for rental registration fees, the parking tax, and the amusement tax, among others. Equally important, I hope the new mayor and council majority will allow NRS to continue its work and never revert to any firm similar to NCC which caused countless significant problems for taxpayers and the city by its lack of transparency and accountability and its apparently illegal procedures. This is an important issue for the people to remember and to guard against when a new mayor and a new council majority takes office. Finally, I have two citizens' requests for this week. Uh, replace the faded worn no parking signs in front of 927 and 945 South Main Avenue. When turning out of Archibald Street onto South Main Avenue at Curry Donuts, cars parked in front of these addresses on Main Avenue make it impossible for drivers to see oncoming traffic. When this safety hazard was reported to the police department by a city resident, the officer explained that because the current no parking signs are faded, he cannot cite the parked cars until the signs are replaced. Please address ASAP. Uh, a letter to Chief Graziano regarding handicapped parking spaces at Park Gardens, and I'll provide more specific information to Mrs. Craig following tonight's meeting. And that's it. 5B. Authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to accept, receive, and record a gift of real estate from FMP Realty LLC, consisting of a parcel at the intersection of Capouse Avenue and Marion Street on the northeast corner of said intersection to provide for additional parking in the neighborhood. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5B be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question? Yes, just on the question, uh, as I stated earlier, I, I had a few questions on this. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not totally up to date on it, but I re recall from history that this parking lot was put there and the zoning board didn't approve it. That's why it was never utilized by the business that was uh -huh. across the street. Mm -hmm. um, they were rejected for parking there and, and it's sat there ever since. Mm -hmm. um, now, I don't know you know, if it's still part of the business that was on the corner, if it had, would enhance the sale, if it was approved as parking, but in this particular case, we're taking it back in the city. Mm -hmm. So we're going to pick up the liability for it. Um, but I've known, just from my time on here, anyone that wants to put in their own parking lot has to come up with the drainage plan and, and all your, your surveys and all that stuff. Uh, I mean, are we going to be required to do that for the public if we make this a public parking lot. Now naturally, you know, all the neighborhoods in our cities need extra parking. There's no doubt about it. I think our city was built for uh, to park one horse in front years ago. <laughs> now everyone has three, four cars. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you, you know, I don't want us to get caught in an albatross where we have to spend money to, to bring it up to I mean, I, I would think the city would have to bring it up to the uh, zoning regulations the same as a private individual. Um, that, that's my question. I, I just, uh, I don't understand why, if it's part of that business across the street, why it's being donated separately, if it couldn't enhance the sale. Uh, perhaps, you know, they would have tried again to get, get parking approval, but I don't believe it was ever zoned uh, for parking, and that's, that was the problem. 
-hmm. Mrs. Evans, uh, also would, would our acceptance of this obviously would then take the, whatever the, the property is off the tax, uh, tax rolls as well. Is this, is this a way that they're looking to avoid, you know, paying taxes on a property that they're not using? Correct. And, but in addition, I think um, the parking lot, I believe, is for use by all of the businesses, uh, the employees and patrons yeah, of I'm all the businesses in the area. Is, so and I believe also any overflow from St. Paul's Church. It, I, I believe, it, if you recall, it, it's right across from the old A&A, &A, where the A&A Auto store was. Mm -hmm. And A&A &A had purchased it and with the intention of, of putting a parking facility for their business, and they were rejected at that time, and it's sat ever since mm -hmm. uh, as an empty parking lot that, that can't be utilized. So I don't know how it could be, without going through zoning, be approved for parking well, for anyone either. This is Craig. I believe that Councilman Loscombe and Councilman McGough have raised um, very good issues concerning the legislation and we need answers to their questions prior to any final vote on this legislation. And should we not receive the answers within the required time period, I would advise tabling the legislation until such time as we do. Mrs. Mrs. Evans, perhaps you'd like to call a caucus? Yes. That's a good idea, yes. And, and which departments would you like us to request? Well, I think perhaps we should have um, Mr. Wallace, the zoning officer, present. Um, perhaps the um, city business administrator who could uh, represent the administration since this legislation was submitted to us by the, leg the uh, administration. Um, Mr. Loscombe, is there anyone else that you would require? I said zoning is the big one, and uh, like I said, the administration, but... Uh, Perhaps Attorney Penitar might be able to shed some light on uh, the issue as well. Could we also ask um, allow for public comment um, from the residents of that neighborhood? Because I, I agree with what Mr. Laskam and Mr. McGough said. And in addition to those, um, the city would, would have to insure the property. So I have a lot of reservations on, on I'll vote to introduce it this week, but I have a lot of the same reservations that they have on that it's going to cost the city you know, some money to, to accept this property. It's not free property. Right. Because it, property will come off the tax rolls. We'll have to insure it. The zoning issues Mr. Loscombe brought up, if there truly is a, a need in that, that neighborhood and the neighbors come pouring in here, I think it was some, it's something that council should get behind. But if it's not something the neighbors see a need for, um, you know, I, I don't see why we would approve this. So if it, getting or, back or to the point, if, if the public could also be allowed, yes. or business owners as well. Maybe we could um, hold the caucus, and would it be possible to conduct a, a public hearing in order to obtain that testimony from business yeah. owners and neighbors? The, the public normally has a chance to speak. During citizens' participation. But surely, whatever you, you would like to do. Even um, if we just limited it to maybe a minute or two of comment um, sure. per, per person. Mm -hmm. So would you like it advertised then? Yes, I think we should. And in that way, hopefully, you know, the neighbors and business people of the area will yeah. become aware and attend. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on the question? All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5C. Amending file of council number 54, 1986, entitled an ordinance providing for handicapped parking areas where official signs indicate, defining and prescribing penalties, providing for enforcement thereof, by adding a section providing for a program for the Scranton Police Department to monitor a renewal process on its application for handicapped parking signs. 
At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5C be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question? All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. Sixth order, no business at this time. Seventh order, no business at this time. And if no one has any further business tonight, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. This meeting is adjourned.